this is an interesting episode to talk about, especially since it has so seemingly little real impact on the setting. You know, this isn't about the big war happening. This isn't about the greater reveal of the shadows. This isn't about whatever's going back on Earth. This is just an episode about, you know, what is effectively is a self-contained crisis, although this will have long-lasting repercussions for the setting. So I guess this is a setting-changing episode. I only point this out because, in complete contrast to the previous episode, or the previous previous episode, I forget which, which I found completely disinteresting, this one is an episode that actually does engage me. Maybe that's because of the presentation. Maybe that's because I feel this does more with the characters. To use a good example of what I mean by that, this is another uh, good episode in which we see how the characters interact with each other and that being an insight into their character. Uh, I, obviously, it's not really a big revelation in any given case because it's not like we didn't know several of these things about these characters. You know, we know Delenn is a compassionate individual, and I want to share a quote about that in a moment here. The one that really strikes me, though, I mean, Franklin, well, let, let's talk about the Garibaldi one first because Garibaldi is there, and there's these people just savagely beating a Marquez because, you know, they're horrible. And. They're all like, ah, oh, it's your fault, it's your fault, blah, blah, blah. And Garibaldi reaches up, it <laughs> comes within this close of basically, he threatens to kill these people. I don't know if he literally meant that or not, but he is certainly really pissed off at the way they're behaving. And the poor, the, the Mark Epps like, please help. And there, there, there's this moment where the camera lingers there as if they're going to, to delay to see if Garibaldi is actually going to take his hand, knowing about the infection rate, knowing that he's putting himself at risk, blah, blah, blah. And Garibaldi just grabs his hand, because of course he does, because he's Garibaldi. It was a good scene, though. Franklin is another good example of this, in basically the same way. He's like, all right, we need to get in there and get this autopsy right now, let's go. And he looks up, and everyone's, like, hesitating. Because apparently he's the only actual doctor, excuse me, let me use the right term. He's the only actual healer of the group, because everyone else is like, oh no, I don't want to go into an infectious area and try to help other people. I'm much more concerned about myself. Yes, I do sound derisive. I remind you, I have several people in the medical industry, and one thing I have been taught by them extensively is, if you have to lay down your life as a doctor to find, when you have a real chance of finding something that will help cure a large-term you know, pandemic or, or situation or whatever, you do it without hesitation, because that's your job. You're the healer. You don't say, oh, I don't want to go in there. I'm, there might be cooties in there. And yes, I am being derisive on purpose. Yes, I know it's basically the bubonic plague. I get that. But seriously? But again, it does shine a light on Franklin himself, because he doesn't even hesitate for a millisecond. It doesn't even occur to him to hesitate to go in there. It is a bit of a damn shame because while it is possible they could have saved the Markeb doctor, I can't remember his name right now, forgive me, uh, it's also still somewhat unlikely since they confirmed it is in fact an airborne virus, which is horrifying, by the way. Uh, airborne viruses are really, really bad. Um, <clears throat> this is a good way to segue into something else, though. I just want to say there are several scenes here that are very cliched. But still, most of them are fairly well presented. Delenn's speech to the child was really powerful. Not because of the child. The child actor was actually terrible. No offense, but she was. Uh, at least I think it was a she. Um, and, you know, that's, that's fairly normal. <laughs> when you have a child actor, they tend to be bad because they're children. They haven't really figured out how to act yet. I mean, that's actually kind of the norm. Um, so no offense intended there, but... And so some of the scenes should have had some more impact, like her walking up saying, Dad, come on, it's time to come home, and her dad's dead. However, the scene where, you know, they're standing there and Delenn's giving that speech about, you know, faith and how it all worked out in the end for her, and then her mother shows up right then, which is one of the most cliched writing things you can do. I mean, what a coincidence. It was very cliched, but it was still powerful because of Delenn's performance, and because the very next thing that happens is they're like, ah, faith confirmed, and then the kid starts to look sick and the next time we see them they're all dead oh but i'm getting ahead of myself so delenn uh very much we do see more insight into her character she also has among my favorite quotes ever in this episode i wrote it down word for word just to make sure i could share it with you and i quote 
I didn't know that similarity was required for the exercise of compassion. I love that quote. Because the whole argument was, they're not your people, you don't have to... And, and then she's like, well, so? <laughs> I'm going to go help them. That's kind of how that works. I like that a lot. Um, <clears throat> this is a good time to segue really quick, since we've talked about the characters and that. Uh, some people have insisted that this, this uh, virus is supposed to be a parallel or an allegory for AIDS. Everyone involved in working on this project has adamantly refuted that. In fact, they have flat out said they're a little bit astonished that people think this has anything to do with AIDS, since they actually flat out call out what the actual allegory is in the episode, the Black Plague. They flat out say, no, this is supposed to be, you know, an alien version of the Black Plague, and trying to deal with the fear and the personality conflicts and the politics and all the, the, the horrors that actually dealing with that at the time would have been like. I, I'm with them on that. I don't get where this AIDS thing comes in. So, eh. uh, <clears throat> But this is a good time to talk about... Uh, let's actually take a step back. Let's take a step back here. At the beginning of this episode, there's a scene that... could be argued to be padding. I don't think it is. I think it is part continuity part characters, uh, character growth and part setting building because uh, it's the scene at the beginning with the Mimbari cooking and how it's been two days of solid cooking with no sleep and every each spice has to be used in the right order only once and each one has to be blessed and then they have to eat it and then they have to pause and meditate on the eating and then they have to give some and, and just this whole ritual thing now I'm not big on rituals. I'll just go ahead and say it and tell you. But what I mean that I mean the literal sense. You know, I don't think I need to go, oh, every time I do whatever. But I am big on rituals, by which I mean the less literal sense. You know, I have my little things that I do semi-regularly. I'll give you a good example of this. A real life, true story. Pretty much every night when I go to bed on a comfortable bed, I say a quiet little thank you. I actually say it out loud to the air, to the nothing. And I say that because I know what it's like to not have a bed to sleep on. Now, that's not a ritual in the sense that I go, oh, I give, you know, this, my right hand with my three fingers outstretched, one of which is pointing slightly away from the others, and this hand has my thumb inwards, and, and this, I do this, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's no, like, written stupid protocol or whatever. But it is still a ritual, in other words, the sense that I like to do that each time because it helps remind me of why I am so thankful to have something like a bed. So on the one hand, I look at this and I'm just, this is a ridiculous level of protocol for eating a meal. But on the other hand, I do actually kind of appreciate it because they actually sort of explain most of it. This is about honoring, you know, one of the, the whole honoring someone else thing is of course a huge aspect of Mimbari culture. And we've seen this before. And the idea is for someone of such an honored guest like Sheridan, you know, they go, that, that's, it's because of the fact that Sheridan means so much to them that they are going through all this rigmarole of doing this and they eat this in this way with the right hand on the, this and but that's when the protocol thing kind of takes over. But I still kind of found myself smiling that it was, I actually wrote it down, there was uh, there was a gesture of welcoming, which actually kind of makes sense to me. I kind of like that, you know, sharing dishes, just as a way of visually ritualizing, if you will, but representing, you know, the, 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 the sitting down and sharing of food. One thing I've always been big on in my entire life is the sharing of food. If you ask me right now, you know, you can go and have... You know, the best sushi that you've ever had. There's this one restaurant. It's really, really good sushi. You could go to that sushi restaurant right now, but you have to go alone. My response would probably be no. In my opinion, good food should be shared. And so the idea of, you know, being able to share that food and welcome that, here, yes, share, and then and then I will give some food to the cook who did this in, in gratitude and thanks for his, for his cooking. You know, all that just makes sense to me, and I, I kind of dug it. And then I felt really bad for Sheridan. <laughs> But it is very Mimbari that they not only have rituals in my sense of the word, but protocol rituals in their sense of the word. I think I'm going to start using that term. You know, there's rituals like my thank you. And then there's protocol rituals, which I must reach out my right hand. It has to be my right hand. I can only do it with my right hand with the three fingers. And I've got to do my fingers just like this for some reason. And then I've got to say, live long and prosper, you know. All right, enough of that. So I, I, I would disagree that that, ep that entire section is padding, though. It's... Uh, enjoyable, which is the biggest and most important aspect of something that prevents it from being padding. It's it's fluff, it's flavor, but that's exactly the point. It adds to the flavor of the episode. And of course, it does some service in, in, in exploring the Membari culture and showcasing the fact that Delenn and, and Sheridan are getting closer. That actually also happens in this episode elsewhere, where she finally calls him John 
as she is breaking down into tears. And that's a good segue to talk about horrifying plagues again. This disease is a wonderfully constructed, horrifying thing. This is one of the most horrifying things in Deep Space, or Deep Space Nine. Wow! In Babylon 5. Um, not the most horrifying. There's worse. But this, it's not horrifying because of the plague itself, even though it is a horrifying plague. A plague that has effectively no symptoms until you're within the 24-hour mark, and then it shuts down your nerves' ability to talk with each other, basically. Think about that for a moment. It's no wonder that death is so quick and so final, so terminal. Um, in other words, 100% uh, termination rate. But this is an extremely religious culture. By the way, let's just go ahead and leave the religious talk out of this. I'm just mentioning it because it is relevant in this case. I don't want to get into real-life parallels, please. Can we, can we leave that at the door? Thank you. Very religious culture, which means they have a very strong faith-centered culture. It's, 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 it, it permeates every aspect of their society. We've seen this before. The idea then that there was an island of people who were engaged in, let's just call it what it is, debauchery of whatever kind. Well, first of all, it actually makes a lot of sense from a, you know, a setting-building perspective that a group of people who are much, much more... Uh, Bleh, I think is the good word to explain that, are going to be more likely to encounter some horrifying disease. Because they're being bleh, because they're less likely to do things like wash their hands afterwards, or follow proper sanitation protocols, or not have sex with a monkey, you know, things like that, right? So it makes a degree of sense that uh, some a group of people who are engaged in things that are in, intimated to be horrible would be more likely to encounter some kind of disease. Now, this disease is a little bit, wow, just over-the-top horrifying. Um, there's actually been some rumors and some discussion I've had with B5 fans before, and I'm sure you've seen something about this, too, that this is actually a shadow device, that this this virus was engineered by the shadows, and honestly, that wouldn't even surprise me that much. But the point being, let's, get it, let's keep going. So, we have a very uh, religious culture, and an isolated island of them encounter this horrifying disease, and they all die... And because of the, the lack of advancement of, of them at the time, or because of the isolation of the weather, the disease then sits there, and you know, it doesn't go anywhere. But that island also happened to contain people who were doing acts, even if it wasn't debauchery. That was, of course, an assumption on my part. Let's assume they're just not considered socially acceptable. You know, let's assume it's something not big, you know, not something horrible, like chewing monkeys. Let's assume they're just off doing whatever, right? It doesn't matter at that point for the cultural perspective of the rest of the Marquev because then they now have a, 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 an example of an entire island of people who all died. A hundred percent of them died. And they were considered socially unacceptable. Think about what that would do to a culture. I want you to picture for a moment. Um, I'm not trying to pick on anyone. Let, let's pick... Uh, what's an island? Uh, Britain, okay? Let's say everyone on Britain died. And then we all go and we look. Do you, what do you think of an impact that would have on the mindset, on the cultures, on the politics, on the perspectives of the rest of the world? You know, or Greenland, or whatever. It, it, the, the location doesn't actually matter. That's the point I'm trying to make. The point is, 100% of a specific isolated group die. What do you think other people are going to say about that? What do you think other people are going to think about that? You add into that that kind of, you know, oh, we must be unclean thing, and you add the passage of time, and it's very easy to see how you could... It, it probably reached the point where calling someone of having that disease meant they didn't literally mean that. I could actually picture this, and it's implied in the episode that the Markeb would use this disease, I forget what they call it, Drafa, I want to say, um, as a way of saying, you're a horrible person, using it as an insult. Using it as a way to intimate someone has no moral or ethical center, you know? Using it to say, you're unclean. They don't literally mean, you have this disease. They mean, in a more metaphoric sense, you are someone who is not considered what we believe to be socially acceptable. Make sense? That's fine and good and understandable and totally makes sense. Now add the, this is when it gets horrifying because all of that is something that takes precedence over the actual disease because the actual disease didn't start spreading until a year prior to the events of the episode. So now all of a sudden there's a real disease. Now what? Now all of a sudden there's this very strong cultural bias to say that this disease, A, doesn't really exist, but B, even if it did, it would only hit the unclean. Oh no, our family members died. 
well, clearly the only reason for them to die would be for them to be unclean. And I'm not unclean. So there's no need to do anything like isolate myself from the rest of my people. It's so easy to understand how the dominoes fall in this case. The people who fled in ships, trying to get to the other colonies. The, the politicians who ordered people to stay silent about things. Who demanded that this situation not even be looked into. That we don't even talk about it. Let me ask you something. Watch this episode or rewatch this episode or play it again in your head. And now picture it's humans instead of Markeb. And we're here on Earth and it's modern day. Could you picture that happening? Because I could. How easy is it? to perceive a situation in which fear and head-in-sand syndrome makes an entire populace be destroyed because they refuse to actually face it head-on and deal with it. There is a very good chance the Markeb could have actually gotten help. Lord knows that we don't know if the cure that Franklin put together worked, and we never will. But God's sakes... If they had actually dealt with this situation head-on, they could have fixed this. But they didn't. I've been asked before what kind of show Babylon 5 is. Babylon 5 is a show in which they introduce a seemingly contained uh, episode in which there's some horrifying plague or some great disaster or some horrible mystery. And in most other TV shows, especially at this point historically in real life, well, what happened at the end of the episode is what's called a pat TV ending. Now, there's gradients on how pat an ending can be, but the idea is it's, it's, it, things are fixed. You know, you, you resolve the situation, and you're able to move on to the next one. Or, even worse, the reset button is hit, which is, which is much worse than that. Babylon 5 is the show in which there is no pat TV ending here. Things are not resolved. The Markeb die. Even if there are Markeb who still exist out there, who have survived this plague, as a functional people and culture, they have ceased to be. This is the episode where we finally get the cure, and at the last minute we make the race to the thing, and we open the door, and they're all frickin' dead. Oh, poor Delenn. She is already a compassionate individual who doesn't really understand things like cruelty. Can you imagine what it would be like to sit amongst an entire populace, hundreds of people, and you can't do anything. All you can do is hold their hand while they die. And you have to endure every single one of those deaths knowing you can do nothing. Can you picture that for a moment? It's no wonder at the end when the door is finally opened, she just dissolves into sobbing, racking grief. It's funny because this actually kind of ties into the, the comments I was mentioning. Uh, I forget which episode. One of the previous episodes I've just, I've just looked at. It was today. Um, in the, uh, the idea of what do you do with the refugees who are dying. Do you leave them to die on the cold floor because they're a waste of resources? Because they are. They are a waste of resources. Or do you have compassion on people who are dying and try to comfort them in their final moments? Knowing you can't... There's no third option here. That, those are your options. Say, screw them. Or try to make their passing more comfortable. It's exactly what Delenn chose to do. And you can't walk away from something like that without scars. It's actually really funny to me. This episode has an astonishingly gray situation overall with the plague, with the politics, with the cultural bias, with the personal bias, with the fears of the Markeb, with the fears of the other races. There's no real bad guys in this episode. Some people will argue that, and that's fine. I, I, you know, as usual, I, I approve and, and welcome other uh, opinions and ideas. But the very concept of this episode, in my opinion, is to show that there was no bad guy in this episode. The disease was the bad guy. Everyone else was just scared, or stupid, or blind, or uncertain, or helpless. One final note. One of the things I like with that whole gray perspective thing is... There's 
they're, they're, they're in the meeting room and they're discussing what's going on. And they say, should we quarantine them? The doctor says, absolutely not. And he says so from a doctor's perspective. He is medically correct. Quarantining them will guarantee and escalate the chance of infection amongst their own people and will reduce the ability to, uh, if, if it's airborne, it doesn't really change anything anyways because everyone else is already infected. Anyway, so from a medical perspective, it's a net, it's a huge net negative to do that. Garibaldi points out the security officer perspective on that. Well, if we isolate them, that would be a good thing because we can protect them. We can safeguard them from the other people who are going to be scared, who are going to be violent, who are going to be looking for scapegoats, just like the gentleman that Garibaldi helped. That's why I ultimately say this episode really does work. Ignoring the fact that it just punches you in the gut right at the end. This episode really shows how the crew of Babylon 5 deal with something that really doesn't actually have anything to do with them. They're not really personally invested in the Marquette, aside from Franklin's friendship with the Doctor. They're not really... This isn't a human problem. This isn't a war that's affecting them or their people. This is an alien race and an alien problems, and yet each of them reacts and tries to help in their own given way from their own perspective in order to help solve the crisis. That's a good damn episode. And I'll see you next time, guys. Thank <laughs> you.